this is the Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the 10th and 11th chapters. Glory, Glory to you, o Lord. Lord. They came to Jericho. As he and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he's calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, My teacher, let me see again. Jesus said to him, Go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter it, You'll find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it and will send it back here immediately. They went away and found the colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying that colt? They told him what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus, and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks in the road, and others spread leafy branches they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David, Hosanna in the highest. Ah. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple. And when he had looked around as at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, o Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Grace. Mercy and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. It's good to have Zach back in church. <laughs> you know, all through Lent we've been um, talking about how it's a season for self-reflection. And especially this year we've been using this time to be thinking about the precious gifts of Easter. These last five weeks we've been talking about Ugh. the gifts Jesus chose to give us. He chose to come to us as one of us. Ugh. He chose to forgive us. He chose to invite us into his presence. He chose to love us forever. And then last week we talked about how he chose to give us victory. Especially victory over death and the grave. These reflections, I think, have been an especially good way to lead us into Holy Week. And Holy Week starts today. Today is the sixth and final Sunday of Lent. And there's plenty for us to be thinking about and reflect upon today, too. And, and we might as well start with this Sunday's name. If you look in the bulletin, hey! you'll find that there are two names. And so, just the naming of this Sunday is a little bit complicated. We, we know it as the Sunday of the Passion, and we also know it as Palm Sunday. What you may not know is that the suggested reading for this day, just the Gospel lesson, is 120 verses long. 
It's by far the longest reading of the church year. And I suppose that this is for the benefit of those churches, unlike us, who don't do a Good Friday service. Yeah. So today is the day that those churches get the full account, the, the one of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem, as well as the entire passion narrative that talks about his betrayal and arrest and crucifixion and death. But because we do a Good Friday service, I decided to go a different direction, lucky for you. Today we'll hear all, well, I'll say this, we, we'll still hear about Jesus' passion, that comes on Friday night, and, and Tenebrae, that service of Tenebrae that we do, gives us plenty of opportunity to reflect on, on Jesus' passion. But today, I wanted us to spend our time focusing on that final part of Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, and, and, and it's known as his triumphal entry. And as it happens so often, all of our readings today just kind of guide us beautifully into that gospel lesson. And so I want to start with Isaiah 50, verses 4 to 9, and I'll tell you that that passage has a, um, a special place in my heart. Now some of you know that um, I had to do a year-long internship to complete my Master of Divinity degree at Salt Lake Theological Seminary. And I did this internship at Zion Evangelical Lutheran Church on Foothill Drive in Salt Lake City. I spent a whole year with them. And on my last Sunday there, Pastor Steve Clems took some time during the worship service to kind of bid me Godspeed and farewell. And then he chose to bless me by giving me a verse that he thought represented the whole year that I had spent at Zion. And he chose Isaiah 50, verse 4, that talks about the words of a teacher. And especially today, I'm just struck by what Isaiah says is the whole point of the words of a teacher. They're to sustain the weary. Brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, because of the coronavirus and all the economic uncertainty that came with it these last 12 months, have made us all very weary. And I hope and pray that the gospel word that, that I've shared with you during these last months have helped sustain you. Oh. And to the extent that they didn't, oh. I apologize. But I'm glad to say that this season of weariness is coming to a close. I mean, we have been blessed with uh, uh, that in record time, we now have a vaccine that's been produced and approved. And that vaccine is going to make COVID-19 much, much less of a threat to us. And so for that, we can be thankful. And we are. I think one of the ways this virus has made us all weary is the enforced isolation we've had to endure. But with those virus numbers dropping so dramatically and so many of us now getting our vaccination shots, I'm going to encourage all of us here, all of us online, to really consider coming back to church again. So that we can worship together face to face as a community of believers. After a year, I think we need to reestablish this habit of coming together as a family of faith. 
I think the author of the book of Hebrews, it sounds to me like he's talking directly to us today when he writes, he says, let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. Folks, I would tell you that that encouragement takes place best right here. And so with that in mind, I just hope to see a whole lot more of you next Sunday, Easter Sunday. And without letting the cat out of the bag, it's going to be a nice, nice celebration. We're going to have a, a little light brunch following the, the service for those of you that want to partake. It'll be a great celebration of new life. But I have to be careful here that I don't get ahead of myself. We're still in Lent. Holy Week is here, and now is the time that we take and we consider Jesus and His entry into Jerusalem. And our text tells us that He's almost there, right? Uh, the last decent-sized city before he gets to Jerusalem is Jericho. And our text tells us that Jesus and his entourage have just left Jericho. Now, if you know anything at all about the geography of the nation of Israel, you know that Jericho is down near the Dead Sea. And the Dead Sea is the lowest point on earth. And then we have Jerusalem that's up in the Judean highlands. And, and so it's always people going up to Jerusalem. And that's where this whole story takes place. A large crowd has begun to follow Jesus and his disciples, and they're headed up to, Jeru uh, up to Jerusalem from Jericho. And the Bible says, and we saw it in that passage from Isaiah today, that he set his face like flint. What a cool prophecy that is. And that's just what Jesus has to do, because he knows what's waiting for him in Jerusalem. And by now, so do all the disciples. And so does the crowd. As a matter of fact, just a few verses before our, our reading begins, Mark tells us that the whole crowd, all the disciples, were afraid. But he also tells us that they press on with Jesus leading the way. And as they're leaving Jericho, a cry goes up from along the roadside. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Somehow, blind Bartimaeus, this beggar, has heard about Jesus. And even though the crowd tries to hush him up, Bartimaeus continues to shout out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. Huh. And, and despite the heaviness on his heart and mind, because Jesus knows what he's going to do, he, he takes the time to stop and to Ooh. minister to this blind man. And I hope you caught that Bartimaeus, he Ooh. casts his cloak aside. It's probably the only thing he owned as a beggar. And he, he just cast, cast that aside so that he could approach Jesus. And then after Jesus graciously gives him sight, Bartimaeus joyfully blends in with the whole crowd and begins to follow Jesus up to Jerusalem. Ooh. Now, I really hope that you, that you catch what's going on in this little passage. Because Jesus' fame has spread all through the region, and somehow this blind beggar hears of him. And he has faith in him, and he calls out to him when he knows he's passing by. With great compassion. And knowing full well what's waiting for him in Jerusalem, Jesus takes the time to change Bartimaeus' life. And at once, a joyous new follower is added to the crowd, and the blind man casts away the only thing he owns, just so he can follow Jesus. 
His Savior touched the life of Bartimaeus, and he becomes an instant follower. And he'll follow Jesus that whole 18 miles up to Jerusalem. I put that passage in as part of our reading today because I think Bartimaeus is a great example for us. Why? Because he's persistent in prayer. He's willing to sacrifice everything to get close to Jesus. And, and he just joyfully responds to his Ew. healing by following Jesus to Jerusalem. He is a great example. And then I think about how that whole crowd then continues up to Jerusalem and how that crowd continues to swell. People are lining both sides of the road as they approach Jerusalem and, and the cheering and the chanting begin. And, but I have to tell you, if all we had to go on was Mark's version of this story, we'd be pretty hard-pressed, I think, to, to categorize it as a triumphal entry, entry because Mark only gives this whole story, this whole piece of the puzzle four little verses. Starts at verse 7, he says, then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it and he sat on it. Verse 8, many people spread their cloaks on the road and others spread leafy branches that they cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Four verses to tell this story as far as Mark is concerned. And it's kind of left to St. John and St. Luke and St. Matthew to complete this story. And tell us about how the crowd waves palm branches at Jesus and, and how, how they're praising God so joyfully that the Pharisees demand that Jesus tell them to stop. And so if we put all four of these gospel together, accounts together, we can obviously classify this as a triumphal entry into Jerusalem by Jesus. But I have to tell you, we read these accounts today and we do so knowing something that the crowd doesn't know back then. And if we really think about it, it causes us to, to really consider what's going on in this story. Because we know that those very same crowd who cheers Jesus on Sunday will jeer him and call for his execution in just five days. Palm Sunday, with all of its joy and all of its hosannas, is going to give way soon enough to the pain and the suffering and the passion of Good Friday. And if we use our imaginations and we place ourselves in that crowd, we're going to want to ask ourselves some important questions. We could ask ourselves, would I too go from cheering to jeering Jesus? And we ask ourselves, what could have taken place in just five days that would make them and us turn on him? Now I suppose I could do a whole sermon series on possible responses to that question. But today I'm going to ask you to consider just one of those possibilities. Could it be that the crowd turns on Jesus because he didn't live up to their expectations of a Messiah? You know, for literally thousands of years, the Jewish people had been waiting for a Messiah to come and liberate and vindicate Israel. Ever since the kingdom split after Solomon, Israel in truth had been on the decline. And they'd been ruled by a whole host of different kings and princes, pagan 
kings and princes. At different times, the Israelites had been ruled by Egyptians, Assyrians, Babylonians, Persians, Medes, Greeks, and now the Romans. For hundreds, thousands of years actually, pagans had controlled the nation of Israel. And as Jesus entered Jerusalem, the crowd hailed him, I hope you got this, as son of David. The Israelites know David as a great warrior king. David is the one that united the 12 tribes and made Israel a strong, independent country. And they hoped that Jesus would also be a warrior who would liberate and, and, and make Israel again a very strong country. But you know, if they had paid attention, if they had seen the way that Jesus chose to enter the city, yeah. it would have been a clue to them that he wasn't going to be that kind of a messiah. Jesus doesn't enter Jerusalem on a war horse behind a, a, an armed chariot. Jesus enters Jerusalem the way the prophet Zechariah said he would. Gentle and riding on a donkey. And so I think part of the reason that the crowd turns on Jesus is that he didn't live up to their expectations of how Messiah was going to take care of business. And so if we're part of that crowd, we need to be asking ourselves, will I turn on Jesus? If he doesn't live up to how I think he should be taking care of my business? In our world today, failing to meet expectations can have catastrophic results. And so what happens if our prayers for healing or employment or love or release from pain and worry and weariness, what happens if those prayers aren't answered the way we want them to be answered? What if Jesus fails to meet our expectations? Will we go from shouting Hosanna to crucify him? Will we Go from waving palms before him to shaking our fists at him? I think these are the kinds of good questions that we can be asking ourselves during this time of self-reflection of Lent. I have to tell you, I uh, changed my mind about what I told the folks on Thursday at Lutheran Lunch Bunch. I told them that um, I didn't think I wanted to give away palms on Palm Sunday. I, uh, I think I might have even mentioned that I, I thought that waving palms seemed kind of old-fashioned and out of date. I was wrong about that. <laughs> and yesterday I realized it and um, uh, I just felt like I had to do something about it, so I made some last-minute phone calls, and they made a last-minute drive to Draper to pick up palms to give you today for Palm Sunday. And not just so that we could wave them as we sing, though I hope we do that too. I wanted you to be able to take these palms home with you today after the service. I wanted you to have a remembrance of how quickly our human nature can change from good to bad. Those same people who waved palms at Jesus on Sunday wanted him dead by Friday. And so during these days of Holy Week, I'm going to encourage you to look upon these palms and remember everything that Christ did for us, even though our human nature can so often be dark and fickle. And to that end, 
I want to do something a little bit different. I'd like to bless the palms for you. So right now I'm going to invite you to stand and take one of the palms if you grab one uh, as you came in. And uh, let's pray God's blessing on them. Gracious God, on this Palm Sunday, I ask you to bless the palms your people hold. May they remind us of all you did for us in Christ Jesus. When we look upon them in the days and weeks ahead, may we remember the joy of you coming into our lives. As we wave them, as we lay them at your feet, give us grateful hearts, ready to praise and serve you. Now while you're still standing, I'm going to ask that you set your palm fronds down for just a second. And I'm going to ask you to kind of put your hands out before you. Look at the back of your hands. Now some of you young folks, they're going to look strong. They won't have any blotches on them like some of us have. Maybe no wrinkles. Maybe... They won't look too weary. And I'm going to ask you to turn your hands like this and to consider your own palms. They too need a blessing. Gracious God, I ask you to bless these palms that we lift to you in prayer that we use to do your good work. Remind us when we look at them that these are the palms that you would have us lay before you. Ah. During this Holy Week, Lord, help us give ourselves to you. Bless and keep us safe as we journey with you to the cross. And to the glories of Easter. Amen.